Yo, Pierre, you wanna come out here? In New York, I merely rock. Hide it in my socks. Running from a up, and I shoot that up. I like to say one thing first. Okay, go ahead. The Celtics are not that good. <laughs> who said that? I've been saying this since last July, and Eric said, "Come on, man! Look, first of you all, don't win sixty games without being a good team. You me, don't win me, fifty games without being a good team." You don't oh, get no. to be the number one seed without being a good team. I was just looking all over the place looking for a mercy roll. That's all I was looking for. I was looking for, where the mercy roll? Where the mercy roll at? Because they, need, <laughs> they need it up there in Boston. Why are you hating on the Celtics? Poor so Boston. Yeah. I said it since last July. Look, the Celtics aren't that good of a team. I know you did. You're also a, a true to Atlanta to the heart. So we're we going to get to that later. Look, um... You bring all that negative energy. Look, um, we got a special guest in the building, y'all. Uh, two-time NBA champion, three-point sniper, Mr. Craig Hodges is calling into our show right now. Mr. Hodges, how are you doing, sir? Oh, we're about to get him, actually. Sorry, excuse me. We're getting him. Is he ready? Two rings. Oh, he got two rings. That's yeah, the Bulls. Morris more than Chris Paul, but... Why did I even? Why did I even do that? <laughs> it's depressing watching all these point guards flourish in the you NBA. That's your boy, man. It is my boy. That's why it's hard. All these point guards just. Darren Williams about to get a ring, man. He's ready, Mister Hodges. How you doing, sir? Hi, brother. Oh, hey. we we it's, it's five of us deep. We gonna introduce ourselves. My name is Eric Yaboa. Next, my name is Rashad Milligan. I'm Jeremy Johnson. I'm David Norwood. I'm Akeem Balam. Hey. From Atlanta, hailing from Atlanta, man. We really thank you for calling to the show. Uh, how how you doing this morning? I'm doing fine, brother. <laughs> so, um, how did your season? I saw your high school coach. How did your season go? Well, you know, first of all, um, just brotherhood. Uh, we had a we had a decent season, man. It was mm-hmm. it was um, it was good for the young men. They realized the importance of uh, student education and being a student athlete and. Realizing that it's um, it's something that you have to work at, you know, basketball wise, we we probably overachieved, which is always a good thing. We still have uh, we still have a lot of work to do, but we got some good young brothers who should be recruited Division One in the next two years. Do you do you see yourself more as not even just a coach, but even a mentor, just with those kids and how how many distractions they have to deal with on a daily basis? No doubt, man, and that's the that's the biggest thing for me. I look at it, I'm I'm glad I came through in the generation where I came through because with the distractions of all the technology and all of the uh, imagery that's going on, man, it's a uh, it's a lot to get to uh, keep young folks focused. For sure, for sure. Is, are they, is it also just coaching them? Is the NBA influence obviously on these young kids? It's going to be it's going to be pretty strong. Is it tough? Getting through to them to play at a at a certain pace at a certain uh, uh, style of play is as a lot of them will probably try to imitate their favorite NBA players. Yeah, well, you know, for me, it, the fundamentals don't change, and and I was blessed to have great fundamental teaching at you know elementary school, junior high, and at high school level. Steve Fisher was my high school coach from um, that just retired from uh, San, San Diego Florida. State, right? So I had you know I had great tutelage, man. And from that standpoint, I think I've been trying to. Get them to realize that, you know, it's not about what you see on TV. It's about the fundamental movements that went in with, that went into what you saw on TV. And, and we have to work on, if that's what you want to be, we have to work on. It's, it's a process. And that's yeah. the biggest part is to get them to realize that you got to fall in love with the process. And once you understand what the process is, are you willing to put forward the discipline that's necessary? As well as go out and do the work necessary on the fundamental, the fundamental drill work. Yes, yes, sir. Well, well, when you see the game today, and you see a lot of the kids on the West Coast, you know, and are you watching those highlights? Those guys, you know, no defense, just throwing the ball as far as you can. Uh, you know, full court passes, layups, 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 no defense. How, when, when you see that, how how does that feel about you know not only what it says about the respect of the game, but just the respect this generation is coming up with, you know, in life in general? Well, you know, a lot of it. Um, we used to have a conversation with MJ about, you know, the importance of 
the modeling and the imagery that's put out here and that, you know, so many times within the context of how we play the game, how those, the way that we play the game is branded. And the game is branded in a in an individual style now and that with all brothers and what they were doing out in Chino Hills, it's caught on like fire. So they're playing almost a style like Paul West had did early in the 80s, in the late 80s and 90s at uh, Lowell and Marymount and later on with the Lakers, where it's run and gun, we're going to see how many points we can score and the like. I think oftentimes we, we lose value of what the game has to offer on a fundamental level when we just play to the strength of a couple people. For sure. Right, right, right. Do, do you, or oh, you just mentioned it, What what is kind of your uh, opinion or your take on on Lonzo and LeVar Ball, the whole, uh, all the media attention they've been getting lately. Like I said, I, pre- I appreciate it. And once again, I'm not hating on the way they play the style, the style of play that they play. I, man, you, you, play, you play to the mix of your players, and if you have the ability to play that style of play and, you, and you're winning, I, I, kudos, man. Likewise on, on what he's doing um, as far as the statement basketball-wise, as far as the statement with his shoe and all of that, I applaud him for it, man. I applaud him from the standpoint that – you never know how long you're going to be able to be in the game, and he's doing something that's from an entrepreneurial standpoint that can last a lot longer than his game. So why shouldn't he put it in place? And um, I think it's a lot of people hating because they either didn't have the wherewithal or the thought process that, or just an old man that would be willing enough to take a stand like his old man has done. And I appreciate it. And if y'all get a chance to holler at him, tell him I'm going to reach out to him and, and support him, man. For sure. So, so you will buy a pair of the ZO twos. I didn't say I'm gonna buy them. <laughs> Let me enjoy their product. <laughs> right, right. I hear you. I hear you. Is this uh, what you envision Jordan doing? Like breaking apart of Jordan, starting his own thing? You know, and and that's the thing. You know, Jordan. Jordan started. You know, MJ had the uh, had the net of Nike or the trampoline of Nike or whatever, however you want to call it. This, this young man is going out. Basically, on his own, on his own, from a standpoint that he may not play one game in the league, you know, heaven for God forbid that something may happen. But he's done something that separated him from the pack, and I'm cool with that. MJ was able to do it with the help of Nike. This young man in a different generation saw that model and was able to take that model to this generation on a different level. Was oh, go ahead. Uh, Craig, I can't even hold it in anymore. Like, this has been killing me. I had to bring this up, man. So, we we have this, this quarterback, right, that four years, five years ago was the starting quarterback in the Super Bowl. You know, you, you were a, a, a vivital part of a championship team, right? And uh, as soon as you spoke out against something, as soon as this man spoke out against something publicly, he's been blacklisted, blackballed from the league. And he can't find a job. 96 quarterback jobs in the league, and he can't get one. Uh, you know, just, just if you could speak to Colin Kaepernick, have you spoke, uh, spoken to him, first of all? And uh, fact, if you have, um, what, what would you in say? In fact, we was, uh, we've been in touch, so we're supposed to sit down. Hopefully, you know, Lord willing, we can get to. He's been doing his thing as far as uh, Know Your Rights campaign across the country. And once again, man, I applaud that brother for coming to the consciousness when he did, you know, and one of the things that I, I applaud him for is that, you know, being conscious from what I see, I'm sure he had this on his mind five years ago, but he wasn't in a position where he felt stable enough to make that, that stand, man. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that he's put enough away and, you know, pocketed enough away to be able to take care of him and his family because, I, you know, you can see the writing on the wall, man, and as far as they're not – they really don't want to give him a chance. And when I look at, you know, um, Johnny Manziel getting opportunities to come in and work out for teams, and this man has done nothing other than stand up for a righteous cause, and that has caused him an opportunity not to make money for his family, that's not cool. That's not right. And I think we as, we as um, brothers have to support him both in person and from afar, and I think that's the beautiful part of uh, – this generation with social media, you can you can have somewhat of a safety net and some insulation with people who feel and are like and are of like mind. So 
you know, I applaud him, man, and I, I support him whenever I have any opportunities to through these type of discussions and when I'm speaking at my own book signing. So I make sure that people realize that I got your back as best I can from afar. Okay. Um, I guess, you know, tell me what responsibility do, do professional athletes have to be more vocal about things that are going on and seeing the Colin Kaepernick situation seeing how it's kind of affected his career. How, right. What are, what are you looking at as far as other athletes to maybe take that stand, like maybe someone like Cam Newton or even Tom Brady yeah. to come out? Right. And you know, one of the things that I think um, has to happen, man, is the the actual engagement process and the implementation process has to happen on a grassroots level. So we who are the consumers will almost – you know, press brothers in a direction by either not supporting products or not supporting the games in which they play. And then I think, you know, we who are athletes and entertainers, we, once again, the, the general black populace, we have choices to make just like our athletes and entertainers do. So as we go out and buy Jordans as consumers or we go out and buy these products that don't nat- naturally circulate back to us, those are decisions we as consumers have. Likewise, the choices that we as athletes and entertainers have is whether or not to take a take a, uh, a role that you know is not going to be conducive to our growth as a people or whether it be us stand up against somebody like a Donald Sterling in real fashion. And I think it what has to happen is that many of us may not have the courage or the wherewithal or knowing that it's a shrinking opportunity on this window of money we're getting ready to make so we won't say anything, we have to be able to put up enough resources to be able to support our athletes and entertainers who are going out putting this stuff on the line and not getting any support, man, and not getting visible support. I want the visible support to be when Cam Newton comes to town, enough of us to let him know that, hey, man, you got to support Colin, that all of the black quarterbacks in the league should be taking a knee with this brother, or at least – showing a united front and taking a picture with him in front of his, you know, Know Your Rights campaign or something. It's, it has to be. We have to be less cowardly in our approach, man. How much of it, you kind of hit on it, but how much of this, uh, for players who are not speaking out, how much of it is guys maybe just not being educated on the history? Or, yeah, or that's, I think that has a lot to do with it. Mm-hmm. And likewise, I think it has a lot to do with where we are as a people that we haven't been educated to the to the mindset of who we truly are unless we go to some universities or but we're not getting it on a an infusion level at the elementary school level where it's touching not only us but it's touching white children also so that now the conversation is actually a real life reality check that we actually live in this thing so it's it's um it's a process that I know that Right now, I can feel it's the energy that's going on on the planet, man. It's, it's the energy going on within black people. It's the energy going on within this country. You can tell governmentally was, that it's something that's happening, and nobody can truly put their finger on it, but I just want people to know that the resurrection and salvation of our people is at hand, and that the fact that we're having this conversation about Colin, we're having a conversation about a young man that has his own shoe company, that we're moving in directions where we never thought about being, but just our natural experiences are taking us to places that are going to bring about a difference in the people. And I think we need to, and I applaud y'all for these type of uh, radio shows and podcasts, that they're moving us in a direction where independence is first. To me, we can't be liberated until we first liberate our minds, man. And I think the... The verbiage that comes through on a conscious line and what you guys are doing and the stuff from my book, those are movements that have to happen in order for us to do this thing from a foundational end of things and not think that we got it covered because the top 2% of black people are speaking a certain kind of way, but the bottom part of us ain't even hearing it. So it has to be a connection between us, you know, to to the, the people on the street, to the educators, to the athletes, to the entertainers, to the politicians, that we all got to play a role in this, man. Um, you know, a lot of attention has been focused, of course, you know, on, on Kaepernick, but do you feel as if the tide is turning into a point where, you know, athletes, particularly, you hit on it a little bit earlier, you know, with, you know, the, the social climate of the times and, and right. you know, with the, with the rise of Black Lives Matter, do you feel like that social issues are becoming 
something that's becoming more and more and more on the conscience on the conscience of athletes across the board? Yeah, because you know one of the, one of the uh, real great things about us as a community of athletes, and I'm speaking, I'm, it's not so much stereotype, but I'm just speaking from where I'm speaking from is my experience is that none of us grew up with a, a silver spoon in our mouth, man. We all grew up mainly in the hood, and we all had homeboys that were better players than us and that we all talked about when we got an opportunity to go to the league or make money or do whatever, we were going to come back to the community. And I think oftentimes that doesn't happen because of the disconnect between the agents and that agents don't want athletes to be conscious and because it takes away from their feed line. We have to realize that right now our athletes and entertainers are a very integral part of the resources of our, of our community, and we have to start teaching them, catching them before they get into that AAU garbage where now we're being exploited on that level. And just the exploitation of the black athlete has been historically been a problem, and that, that's the line in the sand that brother like Mike Mood, Abdul Raouf, brother like Colin, brother like myself, we're trying to make sure that that line in the sand is a reality that we start to live in reality and truth around this thing that is not just, we're not just talking about it. We have a young generation of athletes that are coming through consciousness that now the next generation athletes should be ready to deliver, whatever delivery may be. And that's the wild part about our liberation struggle is that we don't know what the goal line is. We don't, we don't have a scoreboard that we know where we are in the game, that we ain't never tasted what freedom is. We ain't never tasted what justice is. We ain't never ate a hamburger when we was free. So we don't know what that's going to feel like. So we almost working on a mission without a goal line, but we know through the spirit that we feeling that we're getting ready to win a championship. And that's what I want our people to vibe on is that stay positive because it's, it's getting ready to happen. I don't know what it is, but I know it's coming for us to happen because the cycles of time and the cycles of this thing is pointing in the direction of our rise, and we just got to be ready for it and build a vehicle big enough to contain all of our people who have been exploited over these years. At what point do we hold these organizations responsible for, you know, what's going on with Colin and what, you know. But, you know, one of the things I was going to say, you know, in, in that last, in the last, within the last question is that, you know, Honestly speaking, brothers, you know, we see it. We know, we know later for the organizations. And I think, you know, later for them, if they ain't, if they ain't rolling in the direction of where the heartbeat is at today, and the heartbeat is with y'all. I don't get it twisted. I know I'm 56 years old. The heartbeat is that 27, that Chief Keith young brother that I got to holler at in Chicago, <laughs> these young brothers. That's, that's the heartbeat. I don't deny that. I don't get caught up into thinking that it's about... In, in NAACP, or it's about the Nation of Islam. I'm not, I'm not, hey, they, they doing their thing, man. They, they paying their lights, they paying their bills, they out there doing their conferences, they're doing their thing. But on a grassroots level, where are we at? Where are we? Because we the decisions making, man. We, that's why I'm telling people, man, it's a local to local, individual to individual education education going on to where now we're going to see a blanket coverage because we're having these local-to-local -local interactions and not waiting for anybody or any one organization to save us. To, none of that, man. That's why when I wrote my book, my book is an economic vehicle. The money's going to recirculate. And that off of that, I'm going to write another one. So right now I'm, I'm in the process of writing a children's book because the brother who told me, brother in Atlanta at Nubian Bookstore, told me, hi, you got to do a children's book. So I'm doing that this week. I'm sitting down with an illustrator in Chicago. So we just have to keep a conscious momentum going and don't take no plays off like when we're in the league. That's the difference between the league and high school. We don't take no plays off and learning how to play like that. And that's the same thing that we have to take this mission that we ain't taking no plays off. Every day, every minute, we're getting new contacts, new information out there, bringing people up to speed, rolling out, making sure we don't never let no grass grow under our feet. You kind of mentioned the disconnect a little earlier. Could you talk about that moment you had, I think it was before the finals, the conversation you had with Michael and, and Magic about protesting? Right. Yeah. Right. You know, and that, that's the thing that, you know, for me, 
being a child of the movement, having a chance to go to Long Beach State and study the movement and seeing those those examples that work, those examples that have had some type of um, energetic action that caused a movement. And when I look back in 1963 at the NBA All-Star Game with Elgin Baylor and Jerry West, and they said, hey, man, it's time for us to get together. And the only way we can stop this from, the only way we can make a move is during this All-Star Weekend because we make them so much money, and they did a stand that they, they sat down, and they got concessions. That's an example for us. The boycotts of the 60s that Dr. King taught us, those work. And I'm saying those examples that work, we have to utilize them and not be afraid to utilize them. So for me, I feel like we have an opportunity within the context of sport to be able to make a difference because we're 90% of the imagery. Did you, like, I guess during that, even during that time, did you, having all these, these thoughts, these feelings, and being so strong in your stance, did you kind of right. feel isolated there alone in the league with, with everything you were trying to do? And that's the thing, like, with, with, when we're in the finals, 21 of the 24 athletes in the 1991 finals between us and the Lakers, between the Bulls and the Lakers was, you know, to me at that point in time, we had the, the strength in numbers to be able to have a sit down, to be able to boycott the finals and see where it shake down, what, what would happen in as far as management and upper management would be concerned. But we as, we as athletes had the choice to make. Magic and, and Magic and MJ said it was too, it was too, that was too, uh, severe. And our condition is severe. You know, when I look at what went down with Donald Sterling, Magic was the first person that I called. He called me back. He called me back when I called him and I haven't heard back from him since. He told me I was going to have a part in whatever we came up with. But once again, the owners, the owners, when the stuff went down with Donald Sterling, they rolled out Magic Johnson and, Ken, and Kevin Johnson. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. That you bring out players who are palatable, players who have imagery, players who can promote this image of, okay, everything's going to be cool. We got it undercover and we got it straight. But where are the concessions for my people? What came out of that for our people? What came out of that when we when we we put on I can't breathe T-shirts? We take off our Clippers uh, warm up storm in the middle of the flow, but when we take off our can't breathe T-shirt, I got on the Clipper uniform. So what measure did that really do? Yeah, yeah. So you go ahead. Oh, so you're honestly looking for for more as a next step. It doesn't just stop there with with the uh, with the showmanship and whatnot. You you want another step that players should take? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you stop and you think, like right now, if LeBron James and Steph Curry mm -hmm. say we ain't hooping, <laughs> we ain't hooping until black men are guaranteed $200 billion to create jobs in America. That's going to play everything to us. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> on Sunday, on tonight or tomorrow, whenever mm -hmm. they plan again, if they say if one of them cats... Just one of them. Come to the mic and say, you know what? I ain't playing tonight. Because I'm tired of this. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a problem. But once again, the ramifications, the fallout, can we be, do we have a stiff enough spine and enough backbone to be able to stand on the 100, 200 million you done already made? And I think that that's a, that's a great point that you just made. And I think it's also something that, that, you know, young athletes that are just coming through the college ranks that eventually will, you know, be, you know, of the influence potentially of a LeBron or a Steph Curry um, potentially also have to realize. What would you say to, um, to young athletes that are coming through um, the high school and the collegiate ranks and potentially even into the pro ranks in terms of how conscious they need to be of their social standing because of the overall power of athletes, particularly black athletes, right. within society. You know, not, you know, I'm coaching my high school now, and it's a lot of young, talented brothers, and, and they, they, they take the trappings of the game. They're looking at, you know, what they wear, and they look at the cars they drive, and they look at the homes they have. They're not looking, and I'm telling them, hey, man, you know, all that's fine, but that's the trappings of the game. Realize the impact of what a dollar can mean in your community, in your family's life, and start to see where your talent 
can harness you uh, opportunity to command a certain amount. But it's not going to happen overnight. You've got to understand the process. And we have to understand the process of this consciousness thing. That just because we go out and protest, that doesn't mean that we are able to articulate our positions the way we need to. Because we haven't been, we've been miseducated away from those. We've been miseducated away from the truth, knowledge of ourselves. And that this knowledge of self, I have to give it to my boys every day in practice. Because I know they're not getting in the classroom. Now I can't beat them over the head with it to the point where they, their eyes glass gloss over. I have to give it to them in, in, in feed, where now I drop a little bit and then they come back and ask about, it. okay, I know that, that's, that, that hit a nerve that they want to, we can, we now we can holler on that point and move into another level of information and study. So that try to get our young folks to research, to research and know why things are happening the way they're happening on the planet. Could you also talk about just uh, during that time, uh, as far as the discouragement, did you ever receive any from it, other players, even an agent, manager, whoever? Was there any type of people, you know, any people telling you to maybe to lessen your stance or whatnot? Well, you know, it came to me after I went to the White House and seeing that, you know, nobody, it was just a weird, it was a weird thing, man, just to see that you were being ostracized. Nobody came to me except for when I was coaching at Chicago State a year after I was out of the league. I coached at Chicago State University, and I was on a, um, a radio show like this, and, and some guys called in, and I was talking about Chicago State at the time, and some guys called in, and they said that if you, if you um, disavow Farrakhan, we'll, we'll support your program, which was wild to me. Wow. That was one of the, that's one of the wildest calls I've ever had in my professional career that people actually called in to tell me to actually talk against the minister and I you know you can you can try that 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 jump stuff but that ain't that ain't how, that don't motivate me and like I told him I said if you don't have if you don't have the mindset or the wherewithal just to help young athletes then don't help them mm -hmm. <laughs> don't come to me with some type of compromised position in order for me to feel like i'm getting some bread or something and that's that's what has happened to us man we we've, we've settled for the trinkets of wealth we've settled for the trinkets of entitlement we've settled for the trinkets of their little job and and their status and their um uh mark of approval but no more, man. I don't think we're, at, we're beyond that point where we need anybody's approval for what we're doing. We know that we are part of the body of God, and we know that there's a mission, and that our mission is not complete until we feel as though it's complete. So they can't tell us about how to run this, man. It's about us knowing that the reality of this is this morning you brothers got up and put on this radio show and that y'all moving in a in conscious direction. And y'all got an older brother with y'all today to, to tell brothers and sisters that, hey, man, it's our time. And as simple as that, it's our time. So we got to act like that. That's so true. we cannot continue to be like, and that's the beautiful part of the league that I see right now, that the, the black athletes, they're running the league, but they're only running the league to the extent of where they're going to play and how much they're going to make. But they're not utilizing the same marketplace to be able to say, okay, this is how we're going to partner with the league to put resources back in our inner cities. And that's what I was speaking about. And also, in not only the, the black athlete, but also how important is it for, you know, for, for black athletes to be able to utilize that power financially and be able to move up into positions of management and ownership within these athletic organizations? Right, and that's that. That's the that's the beautiful part of um, this championship we about about to win is that we're going to see a lot more movement in that direction, man. Where we can become galvanized, and we can, you know, there's a lot of people on the face of the earth that we haven't reached out for and network build with that are right, white that are literally waiting on black men, not the sisters. They waiting on us, brothers, and I'm telling y'all that, and that they waiting on us, not so much for us to come to them, but they waiting on us. Just seeing how, damn, at which point is them brothers going to unite? At which point in time are they going to show that that they have the, the reality and the knowledge that we are the only people on the face of the earth as men that don't set up an agenda for our women and children? We're the only ones, brothers. At which point in time that's going to change, man? 
and it's got to be a it's got to be a conscious move, man. That you know, I love Black Lives Matter, but I'm saying, hey, it's beyond that. Right now, we matter, brothers. We matter, and if we matter, we got to prove to the world that we worthy. Dr. King teaches. Dr. King gave us the marching order, man. If a man ain't found something to die for, he ain't fit to live. Our mission is right now, we're so cowardly to stand up on points because we saw our leadership get murdered. We saw the ramifications of brothers standing up on a cause like Kareem, Ali, Jim Brown. You know, so we got to be more courageous in these stance and these moves that we make that have to be totally independent of them. Did you did you ever have any conversations with Kareem and, and those guys with the like uh, during your time of uh, Oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. Jim Brown, Jim Brown is a mentor of mine, Kareem and I have, you know, I was blessed to be on the staff with Kareem in Los Angeles with the Lakers, so we had a long we had opportunities to sit down and talk about a whole lot of stuff and you know, they're they're my mentors, man, and they're my leaders and I you know, I always um, I always somewhat um Defer to them on certain things, but at certain points in time, I realize that I have a certain energy 20 years younger than them. So it's certain things that they've given me the okay to go ahead and speak on behalf of the elders. So I, I, I take that, you know, special and understand that I don't take it lightly. Uh, Craig, what, what was the, the lowest moment uh, for you personally after, you know, a couple years went by and you still couldn't find work in the league? Well, the biggest, one of the biggest things, man, is that God blesses you with a talent and, you know, you have, you don't know how many games you get to play, but you also know when you still have games to play. And being that, being not able to work the way that I knew I was capable of working in those years after that, that was a depressing, that was depressing, but at the same time, I took it out on my sons, that I would take them in the gym and wax their heads. <laughs> so, you know, just being able to have a, have a, something that you love and you know you are the best at, and then not, not being able to exercise that God-given talent, that was, that was tough. But at the same time, man, I had a great family support base that, that allowed me to make sure that I got through everything on the one. Did you want more support from Phil? During that time, the off season, uh, and you were looking for tryouts and whatnot. Did you want more support from the Chicago, for anybody from front office, or for Phil, or any other coach? No, nah, man. The only to- really the only coach that could really give me any assistance was Tex Winter, who was my college coach, and and you know everybody else had to take the company line about things and not you know not really say anything about Hodge and just let it you know kind of just blow away, so to speak, and. And you know, eventually Phil came around with the, with the from from Tex telling him that he wasn't going to come back and help him with the Lakers unless he brought me in. So that was a blessing for me to get back into it, and Phil brought me back at that point in time. But you know, from th- from 1992 to like 1998, I was still capable of playing, man. And I would have loved to have. I would have loved for you brothers to see what the game would have been like. You know, during those periods of time, because it's a lot more than three point shooting that your boy had. It wasn't just that. So, you know, it was a lot of stuff that people didn't see me play. So, I would just say, my first six years in the league, I was a point guard. All right, so just to put that on y'all mind. So, when I'm watching Steph do what he do, and I'm like looking at my young boys, oh man, that yeah, that's cool, man. But tell them do it with a hand check. <laughs> You you think you can outshoot stuff? Man, Go. I, brother, you know it's like this. I <laughs> every generation has a time. I, I still consider myself probably in the top ten shooters on the planet Earth at fifty six. You know, so if we just stand and shooting jump shots, I can range up to thirty feet still. That's you know, what? now what we talking about chasing stuff? Nah, that ain't gonna happen. But let's just shoot these jumpers. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, now you might get me today, but I might get you tomorrow. But I ain't gonna quit. That's for sure. What about you? You and Dell Ellis? Who Ooh. between you and Dell Ellis? Oh, Dell got me. Dell got me. Um, he got me in Dallas, I think. But then I came back and I got Dell a couple reps. So it's, you know, it's it's one of those things, man. You come to you coming to a shootout, man. You bring your clips. 
<laughs> and make, uh, and make sure you don't run out. No, you ain't, ain't none of them really going to miss fire. They just not uh, where they supposed to be all the time. And then when you start hitting that bullseye, it can, you can go on one of them runs, man. And that's, that's the beautiful part of, of playing the game when we played it. We played it during the golden era of the game. So a lot of the top shooters that they talk about and the top players they talk about was during that from 1980 to... 2000 era man and we were blessed to be a part of that that movement and changing the game just i know you you play with mj and you know there's the great debate between him and lebron james right now mj play with me man <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, we got you we heard it <laughs> <laughs> but just tell me you know tell people how it, how it was to play you know what? How MJ went about his business versus how you see LeBron go about his, as far as preparation and who you think is better. Well, we we were having this discussion last night, and um, one of the first things that come up is that people always acknowledge MJ played in six finals and won six finals MVPs. And I made the point that LeBron has played in seven in the last seven finals. You know what I'm saying? So he's making marks as far as being in eight finals in 14 years or something crazy like that. That he's on a he's on a, a trajectory where he could be the greatest winner of all times in the, in the game, as well as the greatest player to play the game. And you know, when I look at when I look at people ask about who's better, I always say it's a generational baton passing. That you know, Dr. J taught MJ, MJ taught Cove, Cove taught. You know what I'm saying? That it's a it's a generational greatness that comes through. So we have the greatest of all times through and throughout history. And I think. Throughout the history of the great game, you have the greatest of those times. And I think the greatest of those times put in the, then they all go into this pot for the greatest of all time. And I always say that, you know, you could possibly do that if you was talking about swimming or tennis, but you can't do that when you're talking about a team sport. So I feel like, you know, to me, LeBron, the thing that I love about LeBron and, and watching him and listening to him, I, I haven't seen his pregame workouts or anything, but I just see his, I see what comes out in the end, so I know what's going on in, in pregame. So I know he's working on his game, but also he's very conscious of making people better around him. And that was something that MJ didn't come into until when we started winning championships. I felt like he probably could have won earlier had he taken that position of trying to be great, but of trying to make his teammates better. But in fact, during that period of time, we were we were coming into. When MJ made the statement that when they made that I be like Mike routine, that was the culmination of the most selfish part of the game. And that, that took us into this generation of branding. And MJ was the first uh, athlete in a team sport to be marketed as a golfer. So we have to see the individuality in that. And a lot of that permeated through the society and, and us not putting back things because everybody was trying to get theirs. Now, speaking of Jordan versus LeBron on the court, what, what about them off the court? You know, LeBron has been, you know, much more outspoken during right. his career. It gives back, you know, to Akron openly and publicly and everything. Uh, are you proud of LeBron when you see him, you know, doing some of those things that you mentioned earlier that, that black athletes and, and that's empower the thing that, you know, and that's the beautiful part of watching him and his growth, man, and, and seeing that he hasn't forgot where he came from and he's bringing people along and he's educating people and he's teaching people and he's putting resources where they should be man and I applaud it and I'm looking forward to working with him in the future man does that all that he does does any of that surprise you with all the backlash and the how people nitpick with him and, and whatnot? He you see it over his whole career it's the smallest thing he might do and he gets uh, so much heat for it does all of that seem to just blow your mind as far as everything he really stands for all the positivity and stuff like that Oh, yeah, and it's funny because you're going to have that hate inside of it because we have to realize there's a certain group that don't want us to do this thing, man. You know, it's, it's, a certain, it's a certain collective that don't make bread if we are successful and positive as a people. So we have to know that and know that it's going to be the haters, but at the same time, knowing that a young brother like that is not, he's thick-skinned and he's understanding the point of, Hey, we're getting this done, and we're going to get it done with or without you. It would be a lot easier if you with the program, but <laughs> if you're not, we're going to go on ahead and get moving anyway. So he's teaching for young brothers business, and he's allowing young brothers to, to hold a, a heavy business position in his, um, in his business practice. You kind of mentioned it 
uh, earlier just about the winning Michael and you guys being able to win maybe a little bit earlier if he was uh, able to be a little bit more unselfish or whatnot. That right. before uh, Phil came on board, you guys were forty seven thirty five with Doug Collins. Was right. that change there surprising to you all? Like, how did you as a team take that when they switched and went to Phil and? And let go well, you know, college. for me, for me, it was an easy transition because Tex Winter was my college coach, and I understood that triangle was going to be the order of the day, and I understood how much better we would be as a team. Although Michael, Scotty, Horace, they were, you know, they were, you know, ah, man, this ain't going to work, man. This is how this college, and I told him, I said, man, by by December, by mid December, y'all going to love this. Right, so right about right after Thanksgiving, it started to click in, and by the first of the year, it wasn't even no looking back, man. Because through the through the context of space and ball movement, player movement, MJ had to use thirty less percent energy to get twenty percent more output, and he understood that. So he understood how much how much easier it was to play within this system as opposed to playing isolation one on one basketball. Did that? How much of that system? I, I forgot who it was. Um, uh, John Sally actually w- was given a lot of credit to the the triangle system as a, as why MJ flourished so much. And, and, and it seemed like he was. I don't know if it was taking a shot, but it seemed like he was kind of taken away from what MJ did by giving him so much credit to the system. I mean, how? What percentage of that triangle do you give as far as Michael's success? Um, as far as Michael Jordan winning championships. Ninety nine percent, man. The system is systems win championships. Okay, systems win championships, and that's the beautiful part of when you look at what the Forty ers did with Joe Montana. When you look at what the Patriots are able to do under Belichick, you look what uh, the Celtics were able to do with with um, Red Hour back in this and his crews. It's, it's the systems, man, and, and the beautiful system that, that we have for Triangle, man, it made the difference for us to be able to win and for MJ to be MJ. Okay. Um, do you think having that change, did you think that kind of laid the foundation for what we're seeing in the NBA today where it's, it seems like team ball is becoming more prevalent? I mean, even the Warriors, you know, they move the ball despite right. every guy being able to average 20 points. They right. still move the ball. Do you think that's kind of been – the 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 foundation for the Spurs, uh, no we, doubt about it. That, the you know, and, and those team, two teams that you mentioned, um, Steve Kerr bought triangle system, but he don't he didn't implement it the way that we did. He's implementing the the, the ball movement and the spacing. You know, San Antonio implements it with the dribble weave action where they come down, hand the ball off, then somebody comes and set a screen and roll in the middle of the court. So it's all. It's all triangle basketball, man, and it's, uh, you know, the highest form of flattery is uh, imitation, the highest form of flattery. So when people in the league, we steal from each other. If stuff that works, somebody going to steal it from you. So, you know, I think when you see it to see today, it's just uh, you know, kudos to what the triangle was able to accomplish during the times that we played. Okay. Um, what do you think about, you know, the lack of – other superstars other than the you know the guys we see all the time Steph LeBron Ke- Kevin Durant Russell Westbrook teams that are trying to compete with those guys they they tend to go for these ball movement styles like like the Atlanta Hawks um what do you what first of all where do you what do you think has attri- attributed to there being lack of a superstar to kind of replace LeBron James like you know like you mentioned earlier there's a generation to generation generation LeBron, Kobe, et cetera. But there's really no one I would say that's going to take over for LeBron when he retires because I guess he's kind of eclipsed everybody that's. Yeah, and he's going to be you, man. He ain't going nowhere for a minute, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He ain't going nowhere anytime soon, uh, Lord willing, he can stay healthy and he can retire on his own volition. But there's always somebody, man. It's a young kid somewhere that we don't know nothing about that's working on his game and has his dream in mind and. It's always going to be somebody, man, and I don't. I think the game is in decent enough shape uh, in as far as young people who want to play it, and that you know, even with AAU being an incubator for young talent, it's there. So I don't think we have too much to worry about. I think the biggest thing is that we have to think in terms of making sure that we educate our young people who are going to be athletes into realizing that you're you're part of a larger community. Craig, uh, going back to the system and triangle, Phil Jackson, 
uh, Phil, you know, from the outside looking in, he's always kind of giving me kind of like weird vibes, you know, with the, uh, he said the the players before they had the dress code in 05, they, they kind of dressed like thugs to the games. And this year earlier he made headlines when he said, you know, LeBron and his homies on the plane and stuff. Uh, have you ever, you know, in your interactions and encounters with, with Phil, gotten any weird vibes from him? Oh, yeah. And then, see, this is the one thing. Okay, Phil is cool. Phil is cool. Phil is one championship, say, that's my boy and all that. But I, I, I always have and always reserve the right with any any anybody to. Now, if we have a difference of opinion, I'm going to express my difference of opinion. And I don't, and I, it ain't no love lost. So you got your, your, you say what you say. So like when he was saying what he was saying about LeBron this, this summer, he know he was wrong. You know what I'm saying? And that's when I say as people get older, they go back to their original. So Phil's from South Dakota, man, North Dakota, wherever he's from. You know what I'm saying? So it's been times, it's been times when he done slipped up and that, 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 that racism flex come through because you, he was miseducated too about us. You know what I'm saying? That he he had to come to it and through his head, through his researching and that kind of thing, and he he took on this hippie mentality and all that. All that's cool, Phil. But I understand at times you can say things that are not cool. So and when you say that, I'm gonna I'm gonna let people know, and and that ain't cool, man. Stay with your basketball, stay in triangle. Don't don't <laughs> don't study. I, don't don't be the psychologist for my people, man. We don't need that. We good. Come on for Phil's head, man. Um, what do you think about what's going on in New York right now with Phil and, and his GM? Well, basketball president, of basketball. Yeah, how do you think uh, his tenure there is going in, in in New York? Say it again. How do you think his tenure in New York is going right now? You think? Oh, it's- that, and that's the wildest part when I look at um, when I look at what he's attempted to do. He just didn't bring in the right people to get it initiated and implemented. You know, I felt like if he was going to run triangle. Phil knows that he should have bought me in and allowed me to run the triangle the same way he bought in text to help him. And that was, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm the missing part of his implementation in New York and he could have, he could have had me in there with him helping. But at the same time, when I went in and helped with the, his D League situation up there, that's not a place where I would want to be. That's not a franchise where I would want to work. And if I was Carmelo, I'd be trying to get the hell out of New York. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he might, he about to. He Go probably ahead. about to dip. Uh, I read 11 Rings, and it talks about, like, uh, during this time with the Bulls that, you know, he kind of talked through the media as a way to motivate you guys as far as, like, you know, the whole mind games called Zen Master and all. Do you yeah. think, like, his approach with Carmelo is more just, like, is it legitimate? Is he trying to legitimately push him out, or is it more just, like, trying to motivate, trying to get Still inside his head? He'll tell you the truth. Like he said, he, Carmelo would probably be better out of New York. He's telling real. And, and it's real. So, you know, even to the point where, Carmelo, you went, you went and asked for a no-trade clause. Okay, be careful what you ask for. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. now it's at that point where it's going to be hard to win a championship. So you got to get with somebody. And that's the part to, of the game I don't like today is where, you know, and that's what we was talking about, players control the game. So, hey, man, if I can't beat them, I'm going to go join them. How much of the situation with the Knicks do you feel is Phil, and how much do you feel is the owner, Jim James Dolan? Dolan. Mm-hmm. Jim Dolan. <laughs> Jim Dolan. Put it up, put it up in there. Craig Hodges said Jim Dolan is ruining the Knicks. Look out. Hold up. There, uh, uh, he's not going anytime soon, looks like. You, wh- wait, what did you think about the Oakley and his exchange earlier this season when they, they got into it? You know, and that when I looked at my boy Oakley going through that with him, man, and, that, you know, the whole thing, man, is that these guys feel like they have a, a measure of control, which they do, you know, and they're, you know, they've been born with these silver spoons in their mouth and they feel like we should be in a certain position later for that, man. That, them days is over, man. And I just think that you know, sometimes these cats and Trump is a Trump is another example of, you know, you got this bread so you can say and do what you want to because you feel like you got so much. But them days is over, man. You, we got to we got to realize and see like even with that. I felt like Spike should have pulled the plug even. I mean, I ain't coming back to you apologize to my brother or something. Yeah. You know, but it's, it's certain ways that we have to get better at, at being uh, more men about this thing, man, and more courageous in our positions. 
how much was how much is Oak respected among players in the brotherhood that is, you know, all y'all I mean all y'all guys are brothers. Among the brotherhood, man. You know, he should have been in the he should have been a league coach. And it's just one of the things, man, it's just it is what it is, man. And as long as we continue to operate under their premises, we're gonna get these type of things happen to us and then you're gonna be able to figure out that damn, we need to have our own. And when they locked us out the last time I was telling brothers now's the time for us to start our own league. You know, and people, you know, we look back at, you know, Jackie Robinson, yeah, man, he's our mentor, he's our, you know, he's our image, but hey, what was the economic impact of Jackie Robinson in the black community when they, when they took away the Negro League? That that was impactful to the bottom line of black people, man. You know? For sure, for sure. Did, right now, um, Who's your? I would say I'm sure you watched plenty of ball. And you saw what happened last night. We know LeBron's number one, but uh, who are your favorite players to watch uh, NBA just right now? Currently, who are you tuning in to watch? My favorite, my favorite player besides LeBron James is Kawhi Leonard. Okay, all right. Both ends. And I love, I love, uh, you know, I love Russ. But the one thing I always say, I would love to see Russ in triangle. You know what I mean? He would be awesome in triangle because he could use that explosive. You can see, and that's the part that people don't realize. See, we could establish the post with MJ, or we could establish the post with Bill Cartwright, but we knew that the post was going to be taken care of defensively with Bill Cartwright. Defense wins championships. So me and my boy having a discussion last night. He got Golden State. I got Cleveland. Because I think Cleveland can control the paint better than Golden State can control the paint defensively. You know, so when I look at when I look at the rank and file of players, Kevin Durant is my and Kevin Durant is is me at six ten, seven foot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So when I watch him, those are my guys, man. Those are the brothers that I love to watch. I love you know, I love to see guys that make people better, man, and, and play the game and don't do all of this celebrating. You hit a three point shot, you, you putting fingers to your head and all of this, man, come on man, just shoot the jump with like Look, act as though you have made Jays before. <laughs> Craig, uh, the guys on the show, I, I've compared Kawhi Leonard to Michael Jordan a couple times on this show, and they they look at me like I'm insane. Scotty Pippen. Scotty Pippen. Scotty Pippen. Scotty Pippen. No MJ at all. Thank God. <laughs> Scotty Pippen, and, and see, and, and the reason I say that, you know, think about MJ when he came in the league, and Kawhi when he came in the league. MJ came in the league as a 20-point scorer, man. Ka- Kawhi came in as a 10, 12-point scorer. But he's worked on his game. He's worked on his game to the point where now it's a reality for him to be a solid. He can get you 30 any night, and he can stop the best player on the court. So I like, I like um, you know, I like, I like more of a comparison to Scotty, but at the same time he has that, he has that killer in him like MJ. But he's he's not as MJ gonna let you know what's happening. He ain't gonna let you know like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. You said you were uh, one question here. You said you were a point guard. Um, can you give me your top three point guards right now? And right I, now, I got, pro- I got some. I got it. right now. It, to me, is um, on, Kyrie Irving right now, um, and that's. That's of the, of the people that are playing. So if you're playing right now, you you know, and I love Russ, and he probably would be the uh, MVP of the league. But right now, right now, it's uh, it's Russ, it's um, it's, it's our boy Kyrie. Kyrie the best Kyrie. point guard. Um, Jeff and Isaiah playing at the end of it, but during the season, I would have to say it would be Russell. It would be Steph. It would be Kyrie as far as during the regular season, but right now it's Kyrie as the best player playing. Okay, all right. I was trying to I was trying to bait you in the same Chris Paul, but you ain't do it. That's okay. I'm gonna right, let, let it me go. This about Chris Paul, man. Um, he's another guy that that I would love to be in triangle, but I would also I would also tell him and watching him, he would be better off if one season go out and lead the league in scoring. No, that's that's kind of the knock on him is people want him to be more aggressive. So you think CP needs to be more aggressive? And, and and when I say that, I say that there's so many times when I've watched his game, even when I was coaching with the Lakers, I would watch him where he would pass up scoring opportunities. And then when you would take the extra dribble and try to dime somebody off, it wasn't a positive at the end of it. I'm saying try to score 70, 80% of the time, he's going – 
just the way he plays, he's going to dime somebody off if they're open. Right? Yeah. He, won't, he won't look to score when he's open at times to score. You know, now when the game gets down by 10, he can put on a burst where he go get 18 real quick. And I'm saying go get 18 real quick as long as you can get 18, get now you got 36, and now we're going to 50s. Go, go and do that. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, well, look, Mr. Hodges, we're really thankful for you to call in. Uh, this was great. This was informative. It was all of the above. Uh, the book is out now, right? Long Shot, correct? Long Shot, The Struggles and Triumphs of NBA Freedom Fighter. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at Haymarket Books. Um, look, keep, keep out for it, man. And, uh, for sure. Tell and- the brothers and sisters to support. I was actually I was down in Atlanta last week. Like I said, I was at the Nubian Bookstore in, um, in, in Morrow, Georgia. And then I was at the... Um, where else were we at? I can't even the name of the place. But I had a good time, man, always. Yeah, for sure. Atlanta, hot Atlanta, man. We appreciate it, always. Appreciate it. All right, all right y'all be peaceful, man. You too, bro. Cool. Man, but there was so much in that interview. Like, that was just, <laughs> that was too dope, man. Um, everybody, the book is, like he said, Long Shot, Struggles and Triumphs of the NBA Freedom Fighter. Uh, as you heard, you can get it anywhere, everywhere. Uh, this story's getting picking up a lot of steam. Seems like there's a lot of people covering it uh, and giving him more more attention on on what exactly happened with his time in the NBA and standing up for what he thought was right. Uh, what did everybody else think about kind of what just happened there? It was deep, deep. You know, we talked about everything. Talked about ball, you know, and then talked about you know the, the off the court, you know, stuff. The important conversations we need to be having in the community with uh, with pretty much. You know, with a lot of people that, that like to have the conversation. Yeah, for sure. So. Mm-hmm. And, and at least him being proud of what's going on now. I mean, there was, he said that they, they didn't do enough in his era. But for the guys now, we got to give them kudos. Like LeBron's and everybody else who's actually doing, trying to stand up and do something. But there's also a next level to take it to. Like he kind of mentioned, like the T-shirts and everything was cool. But I thought that was interesting, him saying that. Like there's also more we need to do. Not just the vis- you know, like the physical thing about it, but also get into the community. But uh, he wasn't shy at all. He laid he laid it all on the line. That was that was pretty dope. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that was the that was a that was I think the one of the best parts about it was you know when you know he was talking about everything and he mentioned you know positivity within the black community. Mm-hmm. I think that that is so important because you know there's so much you know there's so much that is you know that is pervade onto African Americans, you know, for them to just be negative about everything. But, you know, the fact that he was projecting an aura of of positivity, I feel like that's really important. And also another good thing that he was talking about, about how it's the young people that's driving it nowadays. It really it really needs to be like, you know, the you know, nothing, you know, of course, you know, you have those that, you know, that we look up to. But, you know, we're the ones that are driving everything nowadays, as as I feel like it should be. And that's such an important important part of you know black culture yeah yeah for sure i think it's like feeling like it's people are galvanizing like coming together a lot a lot and, and, and i guess grouping together and whatnot like you have these these groups these grassroots like he mentioned there's so many grassroots in like every i mean especially atlanta dc and whatever like highly populated black communities but the grassroots movements are really important too and i think more of you know more getting involved in those things uh will kind of help just more push the push the the um how fast this happens, how fast we can get change uh, is everybody coming together with those things, with those grassroots movements. But, yeah. Right. I, I definitely think, you know, I, one thing that stood out was when he was saying, you know, we need to stop being so cowardly, you know, about speaking out and, uh, and all that, regardless of our positions and stuff. And, uh, you know, especially in journalism, you know, we, we, <laughs> we're not allowed to have an opinion because, you know, we're supposed to be neutral as, you know, the people who bring the news. But we're also human beings. And, mm-hmm. You know, if, if we see something that's not right, I think, you know, it is important for even us to say, you know, hey, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. this kind of isn't right. Yeah. yeah but, yeah. um, you know, the, the interview was so good. It made me forget Al Horford had 11 points and uh, five rebounds last night. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back to the Al Horford. That, that, that's y'all boy. You know, the, Wait, who's the boy? Wait, we, we uh, you know, Dwight Where is Dwight. We should have kept the man that can stretch the floor. It was the system. Oh, the. The Celtics, oh, they're so much better uh, Dwight, than the Hawks. Dwight said, I don't watch the game. 
The, the the Hawks didn't lose by forty in the Eastern Conference Finals. Is that, is that what you're gonna hang your head on? Yeah, you gonna hang it? We, 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 we were losing we, by thirty. We, we didn't have Corver. We didn't have Tabo. Uh, Horford got suspended. We didn't have none of them jokes. We had to come back from twenty six points. We still and we. Oh, that was this season. Yeah, I'm just. And we still saying. came back from twenty and one. Look, they're about to get sweat like we got sweat. What is the difference? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, what, 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 is, what is the difference? Is the difference is y'all, y'all said the Boston Celtics are so much better than the Atlanta Hawks. Nobody said that. It, 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 <laughs> that's so disrespectful because Boston Boston ain't getting no type of flag, and the Hawks I've, I've the never. Hawks got all the jokes uh, in the world. I've never heard that. Boston has a superstar. Y'all keep saying. Y'all keep I, saying. I, I've that. never. I never. Y'all keep saying. Oh, he is superstar. He's got fifty three punch. That's what we said. That doesn't matter. <laughs> what does he okay, David didn't say that, but Eric definitely said that. I say he's a goat. I say Thomas is a goat. I yeah, don't care he's gonna what be going says. home to milk his goat. <laughs> <laughs> two two points, two points last night. Yeah, uh, we gonna talk after this one. That's <laughs> Eric and the Thomas family. That's the only people that say that. I love nobody, Isaiah Thomas. Go nobody ahead. else. Nobody else says that. I know, Thank you. I know people in Boston. I know fans up there, and I follow yeah, Boston media really hard. There so you go. Nobody says that, but Eric and the Thomas family. Look, yeah, it's a solid interview. Definitely, yeah. definitely gives you something to look forward to, and uh, definitely, I'll definitely check out the book, and yeah. I'm definitely because definitely, you know, I pre- you know, an hour, you know, he's pr- pretty much just more stories stuff that's left to tell, and yeah. curious to see what this championship ring, you know, to see what that's all about. You know, he said we're so close, so that's something definitely to look out for. Mm-hmm. Hey, positive interview, man. Shout out to Craig again. Uh, we're going to make our rounds, and your bow NBA is my Twitter. I'm passing it to Rashad. Go ahead. RashadMelligan.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Official Soldier Boy. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. Uh, Jeremy Johnson, you can follow me on Twitter at Clark underscore Kent underscore 75. I finally got it right, right off the bat. Don't get my Superman on. Oh, skirt. That is Norwood <laughs> at D Norwood 90. I'm still trying yep. to find the mercy rule for the Celtics. Damn. Can't find it. Because they need it. They carry Akeem over Balaam. to the next game. Carry over <laughs> to the next game. Maybe, possibly. Akeem Balaam on the Twitter and the gram at beyond w, beyond the w.com. Check it out. Peace. We out. Atlanta. ATL. Peace. See you. <laughs>